Hey, welcome back to Robot Cantina. Today we're going to be putting the finishing touches on our 420 Big Block Hemi Swap. This is a big project for such a small engine, but in the end we want a solid foundation to test our street legal go-kart. So let's get started. Now if you recall in the last video, we ended by starting up the 420 engine, and the one thing that was obvious was the engine needed some kind of an exhaust system. I think now is the time to sort that out. For the exhaust system, we're going to be fabricating it from bits salvaged from a do-it-yourself header kit. These bits will give us all the necessary bends and whatnot to be able to go from the engine to the tailpipe. Yep, we're going to be taking this exhaust to the next level and running it right out the back of the car. Alright, so these clever little bits are called V-clamps, and they're used in place of a traditional exhaust clamp. And we'll be getting back to these a little bit later. Now here's an exhaust flange I picked up for the 420 engine. Now this is actually a hefty chunk of steel, and it's perfect for our project. To eliminate stress to the engine, we'll be using a flex joint to isolate the engine from the bulk of the exhaust system. Otherwise, there's a good chance we could seriously damage the cylinder head. Let's take a look at the job at task. Right here is where the tailpipe will exit the car. Now this little detail makes the job infinitely harder, mostly because the exhaust system has to pass through a hole in the rear bumper, and that's a real pain in the ass to do. And here we have a factory exhaust hanger, and that's going to come in real handy. And all the way forward in the tunnel is another factory exhaust hanger. And again, that's going to come in real handy. Now up here somewhere is the exhaust port on the engine. Let's take a closer look from another angle. Now at first glance it looks like we have a vast area to work in, but keep in mind we have to accommodate the right hand side axle. And here's a cartoon version of the axle, because I can't be bothered to actually put the axle in the car. So I found this section of pipe in my scrap metal pile, and it's almost perfect for the exhaust flange. Just needs a little bit of trimming on the lathe, so let's take care of that right now. Well that should be enough, we probably could have used a hammer to make it fit. The tricky part in fabricating the exhaust flange stub is we're going to have some clearance issues once we weld everything together. So the plan is to have a plan, or something like that. <laughs> Basically we need to allow room for the bolts, but there won't be any room, so essentially we're fucked. But I have a plan, so let's just weld it together and I'll show you. So the plan is to back cut the weld bead on the lathe. Now I could use the mill and clear out a bit of the weld bead around the bolt holes, but that would take too much effort to set up. Alright, well that'll take care of the clearance issues. Of course the flange warped when we were welding it, so now we need to fix that. and that's as good as it's going to get. Next we'll trial fit the flange and work out the angle of the downpipe. This step is crucial because even though it appears we have a lot of space to work in, in reality there isn't much wiggle room available. So here you'll notice I pulled the downpipe back a little bit to allow clearance for the weld bead. Once everything sort of looked good, I went ahead and put witness marks on the pipes so I could transfer them to the weld bench and have a go at welding these parts up. Anyway, I managed to move the downpipe without upsetting its alignment. That's good, I guess. And now we need to splice in a flex joint. With a bit of half-assed measuring, 
I was able to determine the flex joint needs to go here. Now all we need to do is cut the pipe and try to keep the cut as straight as possible. So for an accurate cut line, I use a hose clamp as a guide and just trace around it. And it's cut. And I have to say, it came out perfect. So far everything's looking pretty good. Let's go ahead and do some more welding. Off camera I sorted out the downpipe extension and a couple other bits. Let's take a look. Let's go to the handheld camera and I'll give you a better look. Now the muffler is a curious bit, it was salvaged from a Ford 9 in tractor because a fart can muffler the Honda crowd likes to use will not fit this car. Alright so this sort of looks like a scene from John Carpenter's movie The Thing. Yeah I screwed up and to show you folks I am human I decided not to clean up the mess I made. Oh and more evidence I'm hum 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 human. Sorry about that, sort of a glitch in my programming. The rest of the exhaust is fairly clean. Now keep in mind I had to make this while lying on my back in the dead of winter. Eh, it's good enough. So I reckon some of you noticed the exhaust hangers. Let's take a closer look. Just for reference, the nub sticking out of the exhaust pipe is called a hanger rod and it slides into these rubber hangers to provide a vibration free method of supporting the exhaust. These hanger rods can be purchased from various suppliers, but where's the fun in that? The hangers used in this video were organically constructed from locally sourced hardware. Anyway, the hanger started off as a 3 8 by 6 inch bolt and were reshaped into professional looking hangers. Of course the easy way to do this is to chuck the bolt into a drill and reshape it with an angle grinder with a flap disc. And that's okay, but we can do better. Now something to keep in mind, it's never a good idea to weld on galvanized or tin plating. Doing so can release toxic chemicals. The good news is tin plating can be easily removed with a mild acid like vinegar. Using vinegar to dissolve the plating takes a few days, so some pre-planning is required. Now there are stronger acids available, and of course these are more dangerous to use, so for now we'll stick with vinegar. Now as you can see the plating on this bolt has been completely dissolved and the surface is starting to oxidize. This is perfect for our needs. Let's fabricate a hanger rod on the lathe. Most of this is self-explanatory, but the trick to making a perfect hanger rod is cutting an angle on the inside edge. Without this back cut, it takes a tremendous amount of effort to separate the hanger rod from the rubber bushing. Not too shabby, and cheap to make. Next up is the exhaust clamps. The conventional exhaust clamps pretty much suck on all accounts and they're only useful if you don't have access to welding equipment. However, if welding equipment is available, then the V-clamps are the way to go. Now prices can be a big factor, but if you shop around there are bargains out there. For instance, these inch and a half inch V-clamps were less than $15 each and they're worth every penny. A V-clamp kit comes with two mating flanges that allow for a perfect splice in the exhaust system. And as a bonus, you also have the ability to reposition the exhaust if so desired. The only catch is, this system requires welding equipment. Now let's go ahead and install the exhaust. Now I make this look easy, because it is easy. All the hard work was in fabrication and planning. <laughs> Anyway, right here we can see there's plenty of flex in the system and that'll keep the engine real happy. The center pipe slides right into the hangers and the V-clamps line right up.
Now I'm gonna go ahead and fast forward a little bit and you can see how the V-clamps cinch up. And that's a guaranteed leak-free joint. Since our street legal go-kart will have an electric starter, it would also be helpful to have a remote control on the choke. So let's take a look at a clever solution. Now this gizmo is a choke linkage from a Honda GX290 and it'll fit perfectly on our Predator 420. The only real issue I have is the linkage moves freely, but the choke mechanism on the carburetor doesn't move free. I guess it's not a big deal and the linkage would probably work just fine, but I feel this is an easy thing to fix. I guess it's kind of scary, but this carburetor was assembled without any thread locker on the screws. It is what it is. This nub here is what's causing our problems. Now this isn't a flaw or anything like that. This nub was engineered to hold the choke firmly open or closed. It's a feature that we really don't need. This is a good way to ruin a pair of side cutters, but what the heck. Problem solved. The choke now moves freely. A couple of drops of thread locker for insurance and we can reassemble the carburetor. Before we can put the carburetor back on the engine, we need to talk about one more upgrade. The carburetor insulator that comes with the Predator engine is perfectly fine, but in our case we need to exchange the part with yet another Honda GX290 item. This upgraded part has a vacuum port that will provide our external fuel pump with the necessary vacuum. Alright, let's put this stuff back on the car. And here's an aluminum velocity stack that we'll need to install the aftermarket air filter. The one thing I noticed you can pretty much get anything for the 420 engine, but prices for 420 parts are significantly higher. 212cc parts are dirt cheap. And now for the choke cable. In a previous video I showed this car is equipped with a choke knob and that was set up for the 212cc engine. The choke cable was sourced from a local auto parts store, but they're actually getting hard to find. Now that seems to work pretty good. The throttle cable is a simple connection that works equally as well, although I think I am going to add a secondary return spring just in case. Now this screw is for adjusting the governor speed. Initially we'll be running the engine with a governor, and I think we'll bump the speed up to 4200 RPM, but that's a topic for another video. At this point we're ready to put the car back together, so let's start by putting the axles back in. Okay, well here's a shot of the finished exhaust system and we can see just how close the exhaust gets to the axle. I think we'll be fine. Off camera I whipped up some brackets for the fuel tank. Now these brackets will allow the fuel tank to bolt to the transmission using random bolt holes. Stuff like this is hard to document because there's too much random shit involved in this type of fabrication. The one thing I can tell you is I didn't use a ruler. <laughs> I reckon it's time to top off the gearbox. Now this car uses a special oil that's very thin and it's formulated to help the synchros engage correctly. 
As you can see, the temperature on the thermometer is 39 degrees, but that's sort of misleading. It's well into the mid-teens here, and the only reason the thermometer is reading higher is because the garage heater is running. Anyway, when I pour the Honda oil into the beaker, it flows pretty good. Now for comparison, let's see how 5W30 motor oil flows. Well, it's about the same, if not a little bit thicker. And what the heck's going on here? Don't! Anyway, let's take a look at good old gear lube. This stuff is as thick as molasses. Yeah, for now I'm sticking with the Honda oil. The fuel lines have been connected to the fuel pump, and all we need to do is attach the vacuum line to power up the little pump. Alright, let's take a look at our progress. You know, it almost looks like a factory install, and given Hondas are mostly made from lawnmower parts anyways, I reckon that's pretty accurate. The electrical system has been connected and sorted out off camera, and we'll get into that in another video. As you can see, I added a second throttle return spring just in case. The fuel line is secured to prevent any bad stuff from happening. The aftermarket air filter just barely fit. Well, it kind of rubs against the strut tower, but it'll work. All in all, I'd say she's looking pretty spiffy. Now let's check the quick start guide that came with the engine and see if we missed anything. Oh crap, we forgot to add fuel. All right, let's do that now. That's as fast as it'll go. I just don't understand. Well, sorry about that, folks. It's winter and these things happen. Now, legend has it that if a garden gnome doesn't see its own shadow, then spring is right around the corner. So let's see if that's true. Yep, no shadow. Damn, next time.